my subject today is emotional response to art, theatre and spectacle in the 19th century. Before I start, I want to thank the Association for Art History and the Ampersand Foundation for awarding me the Art History Residency for 2022-23, which gave me four months to work on this project. Working on historical spectatorship is particularly challenging, especially since I'm working on popular audiences, because the people that I'm interested in um, have for the most part not left any direct testimony of their experience. So it requires a creative approach and it, it also requires working across disciplines in areas that are new to me. So this gave me a unique opportunity to explore a new area and develop a methodology. And I also want to thank the Centre for Research in Visual Culture at the University of Nottingham for this opportunity to share my research with you. My paper today is an intervention in discussions about emotions. There's been a lot of work on the history of emotions. Broadly speaking, it takes one of two approaches. Work carried out from the perspective of literary studies has tended to focus on emotion defined as a set of acculturated ideas and behaviours. Categories such as sentimentality or sympathy, for instance. So emotions defined by language terms and particular cultural contexts. Then there's work coming from affect studies, which draws on the evidence of neuroscience. I'm going to mention Brian Masumi later on. He's an example of someone working in this field. He defines affect as emotional arousal, um, a precognitive response that happens automatically and is completely involuntary. This type of response is pre-linguistic. So, it can interact with cognitive understanding, but in its pure form, it's not linked to meaning. An example of this type of approach is some of the work um, that's been done on gossip, which shows that people like to gossip, not because of the content, but because the chatter of gossip releases peace and contentment hormones. So the difference between the two approaches turns on the issue of language. There's emotion mediated through language, and then there's this idea of, of pure affect, which has been particularly appealing to people working in performance studies, because the liveness of performance is something that can never be fully contained within language. But actually, I find both of these approaches not fully suited to discussing art and visual culture. There's certainly something in a picture that cannot be contained in language. I'm going to be talking about paintings by the French artist Paul Delaroche. And his paintings were associated at the time in the 19th century with intense emotional response. But contemporary accounts are often very inarticulate about what exactly those emotions were. I'll also be talking about sensation drama or more specifically sensation scenes. And here too, it's a type of entertainment that was thought to depend on its emotional appeal, but reviews were often at a loss to explain why they had such a powerful effect. I think there's something here that does escape language, but at the same time, the affect studies approach overlooks the meanings that are embedded in images. So. I want to steer a course between those two poles by looking at the idea of reverie, defined as a sort of trance state in between waking and sleeping. The philosopher Gaston Bachelard has written a lot about reverie. He associates it with a kind of creative morphing of a given image. In this citation, He's concerned with poetry, but I think this idea can be usefully applied to images too. So he writes that in a state of reverie, the syllables of the word begin to move around, stressed accents begin to invert. The word abandons its meaning like an overload, which is too heavy. Then words take on other meanings and the words wander away, looking in the nooks and crannies of vocabulary for new company, bad company. For Bachelard, reverie deals in open symbolism, images that can be inverted or morphed into other images. It's not a logical or rational mode of thought, but an imaginative 
and emotional engagement. For bachelor, um, so I want um, today to trace the evolution of a particular motif from painting to theater and back again, as evidence in itself of a type of emotional response, which reveals a process of thinking in images, a reverie, if you like, but one that's distinct from thinking in language. And I want to propose that we can think of each new iteration as an emotional response to the last. My main case study is the relationship between this painting by Delaroche, Young Christian Martyr of 1855, and a theatrical sensation scene from The Colling Bourne, a drama of 1860 by the playwright Dion Boucicault. These two images are going to keep reappearing throughout my talk. My book that came out last year ended with a, a possible actual connection between these two things. And today's talk is, is taking that forward. So I need to give a bit of explanation about sensation scenes. These were a feature of the theatrical genre known as sensation drama. They were single scenes within a play which were thought to be the main draw for the audience. They were often extremely thrilling and they generally used innovative stage technology. The Colleen Bourne has been credited as being the very first sensation drama in 1860. The sensation scene, referred to as the water cave scene, involved the attempted drowning of the heroine and her rescue. And the play had an unprecedented long run and its success was largely attributed to this particular scene. There's general recognition in the scholarship on sensation scenes that they somehow stand outside of the main narrative of the play. They're often seen as a sort of technical gimmick. So Henry Barton Baker uh, referred to this play as the first serious drama in which a mechanical effect was the principal attraction and the first serious drama in which the actor became of secondary importance to the machinist and scene painter. They've been compared to present day action films. Nick Daly writes here that the storyline sometimes appeared to exist only to showcase the special effects. In a way, they're seen as an antecedent of what the scholar of early film, Tom Gunning, refers to as the cinema of attractions, a rupture in the narrative in which a technical contrivance is showcased for its own sake. From the affect studies point of view, these scenes are seen as prompting a thrill response in the sense of increased heart rate, uh, increased pulse. After all, this is the precursor of the scene in early film in which the heroine is tied to the railway tracks and there's a split second rescue. In theatre history, what's known as the modernity thesis is the argument that sensation scenes responded to the experience of industrial modernity. Spectators are said to have been primed by the stress and bodily peril of the urban environment to crave entertainments that aroused feelings of thrill or anxiety. As Ben Singer writes, the modern individual internalized the tempos, shocks and upheavals of the outside environment and this generated a taste for hyperkinetic amusements. I agree that these scenes stand apart from the narrative framework of the play, but I'm going to make a different argument about their function. I think that the view of sensation scenes as a sort of theatrical roller coaster ride that's all about producing vicarious thrills overlooks their visual aspect. I think what defines a sensation scene was not necessarily technical innovation or danger, but immediacy. Um, a recent book on the subject refers to sensation scenes as mind bogglingly real. And I think that quality more than the danger or suspense factor is their defining feature. This quality of immediacy by which I mean the way in which the spectator is able to imagine themselves occupying the same space as the spectacle, the feeling that you are there, um, is common to both the type of art and the performances that I'm looking at. It's what allows for the circulation of a given motif between different media. And it's also, as I'm going to argue, 
what allows for a particular type of emotional response. I want to propose a new way to approach the issue of emotional response that puts immediacy front and center. So I want to talk a bit about immediacy as a quality in art and some of the problems associated with it. One of my main objectives is to argue for the agency of popular audiences, but the immersive quality of popular visual culture in this period has long been associated with audience passivity. So I want to address that head on. Approaches tend to draw on the sinister connotations of Guy Debord's conception of the spectacle, or what Jean Baudrillard refers to as the hyper-real qualities of the simulacre, the fully convincing mimetic illusion, which he argues has taken the place of reality in modernity. The spectator in these types of discussion is often presented as being in a state of passive acceptance. I think this view rests on the idea that although this type of image seems real, it actually only offers a cliched or inauthentic version of reality. And so the spectator's response can only ever be an inauthentic one. Now, this idea of authentic versus inauthentic perception is threaded through histories of 19th century art and visual culture. An example of this is Jonathan Crary's book, Suspensions of Perception. And he argues that because modernity involves a kind of sensory overload, in order to function, we need to focus our attention narrowly and exclude everything else. And this is a utilitarian mode of perception that enables us to operate within an environment of sensory overload. Uh, this is a quotation from Crary. He writes that, at the moment when the dynamic logic of capital began to dramatically undermine any stable or enduring structure of perception, this logic simultaneously attempted to impose a disciplinary regime of attentiveness. So essentially, there's too much data to process. So we synthesize a coherent world picture, which is not a true picture, but a useful one that allows us to function. But Crary argues that no one can focus their attention intensely for very long. So we inevitably fall into a sort of reverie state, awake, but in a, in a sort of trance state. In reverie, there's a dissolution of that synthesis during which we become aware of the strangeness of unprocessed reality. So we need focused attention to function. And according to Crary, certain types of art and theater train or discipline the modern subject to focus our attention in this way. But this state of reverie is of course much more interesting because that's when we really perceive reality. Crary explores this idea in the work of artists like Manet, Seurat and Cezanne. So for instance, he thinks that in this painting, Manet visualizes the condition of reverie as a kind of morphing of everyday objects into other forms, which invite a, a psychoanalytic interpretation. He writes of the slippage between the cigar fingers, the pink flowers that become ear, eyes, lips, and then flowers again. Essentially, reverie gives access to some deeper meanings that are screened out uh, during our everyday lives. And this type of non-utilitarian perception is for him associated exclusively with modernism. This kind of analysis owes a lot of, um, owes a lot to 19th century discussions, in particular, the late 19th century philosopher, Henri Bergson. Bergson identified two types of perception. He thought that everyday habitual perception was driven by need and utility. We have to attend to what directly concerns us, be that physical needs or the threat of danger. But in a state of reverie, we relax our perception and the veil is lifted. 
And then we see the true strangeness and indeterminacy of reality, its refusal to conform to cliched or conventional images. This term indeterminacy is important. And by that, I mean the partial or not totally clear or fixed nature of perception. That's what leaves it open to interpretation. One of the interesting implications of this idea is that authentic sensory experience is superior to what can be understood through language or text. This is because sensory experience is utterly unique and irreducible to any formula, whereas words can only ever describe genera. So this is a quotation from Paul Atkinson's book on Bergson's aesthetic theory. He writes that in Bergson's philosophy, semiotic and numeric categories are the final product of a genetic process that starts with biological utility, which is then stabilized in recognition and representation and finally systematized in various languages. So let's unpack that a bit. So reality itself is irreducible, but in order to function, we develop a utilitarian mode of reducing it and cutting out all that's not useful. Mimetic representation copies that reduced formulaic version and language is the final step in the process, the furthest step away from the reality of experience now, 19th century mimesis is generally seen exactly in these terms as a formulaic, reductive, immediately legible version of reality, more like language than like experience. This is another quotation from Atkinson. He's writing here about the kind of mimetic 19th century painting that I'm working on, so specifically not modernism. And he writes that those features of the environment that are not easily reducible to objects, such as the shimmering of light on water, are often accorded a secondary status. We often admire that which conforms to our own perceptual prejudices. So he chooses water as something that's particularly difficult to turn into a generic conventionalized version and which he therefore thinks is avoided by this kind of art, but I'm dealing with water as a subject today, so we can decide if that's really the case. In fact, 19th century mimesis actually rests on attention to the particular, the accidental, the singular, the strange. That's what gives it its reality effect and, and what makes it convincing. I'm not saying that we should see these images as transparent, windows onto real perceptions. They are, of course, representations. But the indeterminate nature of perception, its openness, the sense in which it can't be reduced to a set of conventions or to linguistic labels, is part of 19th century mimesis. That's why subjects like water or atmospheric effects actually feature so widely in it. So it's not just modernist painterliness that invites the free play of ideas in a different way. This type of image also invites reverie and the morphing of one form into another. I'm going to show how the visual aspect of my examples invites that free play of ideas in a way that works independently of or actually counter to text and language, be that the play script or the picture caption. And perhaps also independently of the conscious intentions of the artist or maker. Frary invokes Freudian analysis, uh, psychoanalysis in his chapter on, on Manet, but I'm working on an earlier period. So one avenue has been to look at pre-Freudian definitions of the unconscious. There was an interest from the early 19th century in the idea of the unconscious, for instance, in automatic action. So things that we do every day that we're not conscious of, like breathing, for example, um, but also 
um, all the minor actions we perform that we don't consciously think about. But there wasn't a consensus about what the unconscious actually signified. Many psychologists thought that the self was by definition, the conscious self, which makes decisions. So for example, although there were several people working on the phenomenon of dreams from early in the 19th century, the general scientific view was that dream images were merely your brain ticking over, producing random images that might have something to do with what you've experienced during the day, but whose contents don't tell us anything personal. That's the scientific discussion, but in the realm of popular culture, a rather different picture emerges. Grandville's lithograph, Apocalypse du Ballet, is interesting from my point of view, and not least because it's about the experience of spectating in the theater, but also because it pictures the process of reverie as a kind of thinking in images, which is not a fully conscious, rational thought process, but which nevertheless is revealing of the deeper emotional life of both the spectator and the performer. The audience watch the ballerina who morphs into disembodied legs or a spinning bobbin. The hands of the spectator clapping also morph into other objects. Objects like the shaving brush become animated. In some respects, the transformations seem random and prompted by visual similarity. But on the other hand, they act out the deeper desires of both the ballerina and the spectator. My case study today is the recurring motif of the submerged drowning or drowned woman. And the first image in my sequence is this painting by Paul Delaroche, Young Christian Martyr, which shows a dead young woman, a martyr in early Christian times, floating in the Tiber. The idea for the picture apparently came to Delaroche in a fever dream and incidentally, there are many such references to his paintings as hallucinations or dream images. He was no longer exhibiting at the salon by this point, but there were a few versions of this picture um, which were exhibited in various places, including London. And it was also well known through reproductions. The similarity of young Christian Martyr to John Millet's Ophelia of 1853 has often been noted, um, but art historians generally play down um, the idea of a relationship between the two pictures. We know that Delaroche began his painting before he could possibly have known about Millet's picture, and also Millet's precise touch and saturated colors create a quite different effect to Delaroche's moonlit scene. But despite those superficial differences, there are some essential similarities between them. Both pictures are ostensibly about female victimhood. That's the text, if you like. Shakespeare's Hamlet in the case of Millet and Christian martyrdom in the case of Delaroche's painting. But they both also tap into a set of associations to do with femininity, water and nature. In both pictures, the female body seems to merge into the natural setting. In Delaroche's picture, the rippling effect of drapery is almost indistinguishable from the water. Um, in both works, the, the three-dimensional body is flattened in uh, by the fact that you're seeing it through the surface of water in such a way that suggests either the transformation of solid matter into some other form or the the merging of an individual body with the natural element. I'll come back to that, but I'm going to move ahead now because the motif of the drowning woman appears again in Dion Boussico's play, The Colleen Bourne of 1860, regarded as the very first sensation drama. That is a play in which the main attraction was thought to be a single astonishing sensation scene. The play is set in Ireland, and at this point in the action, the heroine, who is a Catholic peasant, has become an inconvenience to her Protestant husband, to whom she's secretly married. His servant lures her on a false pretext to a deserted water cave, 
where he pushes her into the water in an attempt to drown her. The whole scene was lit by a full moon that appears through the entrance to the cave and the heroine sinks and rises to the surface three times before being rescued by the hero who dives in to save her. The scholarship on sensation themes presents them as being all about creating intense tension and anxiety for the spectator, prompting involuntary somatic responses like racing pulse and heart rate, through the spectacle of physical danger, your heart's racing and you're intensely focused on the rescue. And this seems to really fit with Crary's idea, which I mentioned before, that the conditions of modernity demand a kind of highly focused attention um, and that this type of entertainment is therefore part of the disciplining of the spectator that many people associate um, with this period. But I don't think that fully accounts for the power of the scene. And I want to think a bit more about what it actually looked like. A series of watercolours by Igron Lundgren, commissioned by Queen Victoria, give a sense of how the action may have appeared on stage. So this is the first one in a series of three. The stage set consisted of a, a series of cut out pieces arranged to create the cave with a rotating sea cloth in the fore stage. The water of the grotto was achieved using multiple layers of blue gauze, one behind the other, with each one a bit higher uh, as, as it went back towards the back of the stage. The villain throws the heroine into the water. She disappears under the water, then reappears clinging to the rock. He then thrusts her down and she disappears again. The hero jumps in and fishes her up, but lets her fall. And the scene used actor doubles. Um, so each of them appear at different spots in the water and eventually they both appear in front of the rock. According to the prompt book, uh, a calcium light was used to shine on the hero and heroine as they rose through the water for the final time. So you would have seen their bodies through the gauze water, which would have appeared as if struck by a ray of moonlight. And this all took place to low storm music. The scene was considered really novel, um, particularly the effect of the gauze water. Writing in the 1880s, Barton Baker wrote that transparent stage water had never before been seen on stage. We can get more of an idea of the scene from reviews of the, of the French adaptation by Adolphe Denery, uh, which is a play called Le Lac de Glenaston, which was performed at the Ambigu Comique Theatre in 1861. The text of this adaptation is completely different from the original, but the crucial aspect was clearly the water cave scene, which alone was retained from Boussicot's play. We might expect an attempted drowning to be violent and brutal, but in fact, descriptions of the French versions suggest that it was very graceful. The actress's body was seen to turn upon itself gracefully in the gauze water as she sank and then rose three times before being saved. The critic Louis Ulbach describes it as follows. The poor innocent stays under the water as long as it takes to admire the perfect transparency of the element. She turns and turns, she rises, she descends with a docility that must delight the machinist by a wonder of scenery and with the help of skillfully placed gauzes. The painted waters are given a limpidity that allows us to see several times the body of the poor young girl rolling under the waves. Never has the science of illusion gone so far. Ulbach's description of the gentle, rhythmic, rising, descending and rolling of the actress's body is more suggestive of dancing or perhaps synchronized swimming than it is of drowning. The spectator is supposedly on tenter hooks waiting to see if the, the hero will rescue her in time. But that's not the emotion that Ulbach seems to be articulating here. He writes of the machinist delight, but Delight also seems to be his own response to the scene. 
Orbach's review also mentions the music for this French version. He writes that, under the somber arches, the moon illuminates the tranquil waters, inviting gentle reveries. The orchestra plays a melody by Niedermeyer. One whispers the harmonious verse of Lamartine. It is the dream of a night of prayer and love. So the French version was accompanied by Le Lac, a melody composed by Louis Niedermeyer in response to Lamartine's poem of the same name. Lamartine had written this poem about a woman he was in love with, Julie Charles. After she died of tuberculosis, tu tuberculosis, he visited the Lac du Bourget, which had been their regular meeting place, and the poem expresses Lamartine's wish for time to stop. So part of the poem goes, O oh, time, suspend your flight, and you auspicious hours suspend your course. But I ask in vain for a few more moments, time escapes me and flees. I say to this night, be slower. This suggests something quite different to the narrowly focused attention that theatre historians normally associate with sensation scenes. The narrative is a suspenseful, heart-pounding race against time, but the, the scene itself, together with the music, suggests a slowing down of time and a graceful choreographed movement in which the body appears weightless and the movements effortless. The image of the drowning woman becomes a graceful underwater dance in Allback's review. <coughs> So I've been thinking about discussions of gracefulness in the writings of 19th century psychologists. Um, in the Aesthetics of Movement, written in 1889, Paul Suryo, for instance, wrote that pleasure is associated with the relaxation of effort, while pain is associated with increased effort and the feeling of tension. So does this graceful, apparently effortless rhythmic movement create a sensation of pleasure for the spectator that's in contrast to emotions produced by the tension of the scene when considered from a narrative point of view. This relates to earlier 19th century discussions about the brain's response to watching movement and the idea that we empathetically replicate the actions of others on an automatic unconscious level. The psychologist Herbert Spencer wrote that the same faculty which makes us shudder on seeing another in danger, which sometimes causes motions in our own limbs on seeing another struggle or fall, gives us a vague participation in all the muscular sensations which those around us are experiencing. So we're touching here on what's known as neuroaesthetics. Bergson also wrote about how the spectator automatically mimics and completes the movements of the dance, neurologically duplicating the movement through tiny muscle movements. For Bergson, the, the spectator's pleasure in watching dance, for instance, re resides in the fact that, like a melody, the movements are somewhat predictable. The spectator experiences a pleasing sense of mastery because they're able to preempt the movement. So again, quite a different emotion to the tension and suspense of the narrative. This quotation from, is, uh, from one of Bergson's lectures is particularly appropriate here. He wrote of the spectator's sympathy for the lightness of the artist. We strip away our heaviness and materiality, enveloped in the rhythm of the dance. We adopt the subtlety of its movement without taking on the effort. And in this way, we find again the exquisite sensation of those dreams where our body seems to have cast off its weight, its resistance and its material form. So Bergson is talking about how watching dance creates for the spectator a sensation of floating. Um, but in the water cave, the actress is in fact moving or floating gracefully through a thickened medium or appears to be at least. In his account, this sensation of floating is also dreamlike. So sleep 
or dreaming and moving through water are aligned here in an interesting way because it's in that reverie state before sleep that the creative morphing of ideas can take place in which one thing can become another, in which a death struggle becomes a dance, for instance. I also wanted to talk about uh, a case discussed by Brian Masumi, which concerns a scientific investigation of children's responses to a short film. It's called The Snowman Experiment and was prompted by a short filler film shown between TV programs in, in Germany in 1980. Um, which prompted complaints because parents were saying that the film frightened their children and therefore a group of psychologists decided to run tests to investigate what was happening there. So this is what happens in the film. A man builds a snowman. The snowman starts to melt in the sun. After a time, he takes it to the mountains where it stops melting. He bids it goodbye and leaves. That's all that happens, there's no script, it's just images. The experiment involved a questionnaire about emotional response and two types of physiological testing. Respiratory responses, so breathing and, and heart rate, and galvanic skin response, which measures skin conductivity. Three versions of the film were made, one with no voiceover, so just the sequence of images, uh, as was the original film, a factual voiceover with step-by-step -step descriptions of the actions and an emotional narration. Masumi's interpretation of the experiment is that responses of increased heart rate and breathing were more linked to the narrative versions. So. This is a physiological response linked to feelings of fear and tension. Whereas skin changes, which, which measure emotional arousal, so not, not any named affect, the raw material of affect, if you like, and which we are not consciously aware of, were less linked to language. Masumi's reading of the experiment has been questioned, I think correctly, but Nevertheless, I think his discussion of it provides a way into thinking about how our response to images might work in a different way to our response to language. The current discussion opposes affect as a precognitive linguistic thing to emotion as a cultural social phenomenon. But here we're talking about two types of affect he sees respiratory responses as tied to the temporality of narrative. So suspense about what will happen next causes us to breathe more quickly. And that seems like a more utilitarian response than the skin changes response, which he thinks isn't linked to narrative. And he refers to this type of response as a temporal sink, a hole in time. And this is interesting since Sensation scenes were regarded in the 19th century as standing outside the main narrative thrust of a play. And that's generally seen as evidence that they were merely vehicles designed to elicit a thrill response from spectators. But this highlights a different type of affect that instead of responding to speed and thrill seems to stand outside of time altogether. And in fact, in my case study, I'm arguing for a slowing down of time that works counter to the temporal narrative, as well as for an emotional register that, that's difficult to put into language. When I decided to add this to my talk, I thought this is going to seem like an odd detour talking about a melting snowman, but actually it strikes me that um, this also concerns the dissolution of a body or a representation of a person um, that dissolves and becomes water that merges again with nature. So maybe not such um, a strange uh, detour after all. I've also been looking at uh, how what we might call the merchandise associated with the Colleen Bourne 
may tell us more about the emotional register of the sensation scene. This is a Staffordshire figurine showing the, the moment when the villain pushes the heroine into the water. Now, this is something that you can hold in your hand and return to again and again. We're invited to linger on it. This issue of a fast paced narrative versus an expanded contemplation is important. For Bergson, lingering is a feature of the kind of non-utilitarian perception in which we're able to perceive the true indeterminacy of reality. I have one final example to add to the sequence. The theatre historian Janice Norwood recently discovered that young Christian martyr was realised in Colin Hazelwood's melodrama, The Mother's Dying Child, uh, performed at the East End Britannia Theatre in 1864. In the play, the villain has lured his wife to a lonely boathouse in the middle of a moonlit lake. He stabs her and throws her into the lake. As he makes his escape by boat, the effect of the painting is achieved when the body of his wife resurfaces as if to accuse him. The staging instructions indicate the form of Stella floats on the left, illuminated by the limelight, which also makes the waters appear transparent. And the villain says, ah, see, see, the form of my victim rises before my eyes as if to track me to justice and retribution. Oh, horror, horror. As he's endeavoring to steer the boat, the form of Stella follows it, tableau. So the hallucinatory quality of De La Roche's painting would seem to have suggested to Hazelwood the idea of an image haunting the guilty imagination of a murderer. So we've got yet another text here, um, but also there's this idea of a, hallucin a hallucination, because in the play it's not clear whether the body is really there or only exists in the mind's eye of the villain. I've shown a sequence or network of related images that I'm proposing can be seen as evidence of the way in which an open symbol in Bachelard's terms can be morphed, inverted, or transformed in a way that develops an idea independently of the ostensible textual context, the script, the caption. Although the narratives connected to the examples I've discussed are different, they share this motif of the female body seen through the water in such a way that it appears transformed or transfigured from a state of solid materiality to become one with the medium. There's weightlessness, the idea of floating through a thickened medium, but also dissolution and ecstatic merging with nature. So I want to finish by saying a bit about the questions I'm thinking about now. I'm arguing for each iteration of this motif as evidence of an emotional response, a process of thinking in images that's distinct from the, the meanings embedded in the texts that go with them. But were the makers of these works even aware of the meanings that I'm arguing for? In the current discussion around emotion, one of the questions um, is about the importance of the kind of unconscious involuntary precognitive affect that Brian Masumi and others are interested in. And I'm interested in the question of how images fit into this scheme, because I see this sequence as operating below the level of artistic intentionality. I don't think that Boussico, for instance, was consciously articulating the ideas that I've, art that I've attributed to the water cave scene. Incidentally, that scene was not, in fact, part of the original script of the Colleen Bourne. It was added after the play premiered in New York. And according to one account, it wasn't even Busico who created it, but the work of an old stage carpenter at Keene's Theatre in New York. So there's something happening here, a set of ideas emerging, but they're not necessarily happening on a fully conscious level. All of my examples are by artists or makers for whom responding to the newly expanded 19th century public would have been a priority. They're all commercially driven in other words. So is the public in some way the driver of this 
reverie in images. Thank you.